better run, man. Life's a pain, but you got me. Yeah, life's a pain, but I got you. Hey, Parasites, welcome back to the Venom Vlog, and here we are. We made it, episode 800. I'm so excited to make this episode for you guys because it is for you. Uh, you know, this episode came about because of all of you. You know, I can't thank you enough for being on this journey with me. I never thought when I started this channel back in 2014 when I was doing toy reviews, many of those videos have been deleted at this point. But uh, a couple of things that I, you know, uploaded around 2014, 15 still survive on this channel, hidden way back, you know, in my playlist somewhere. But, uh, but it was something I never thought I would do long term. It was something I just did as a hobby and I had fun at doing it and always had a, a you know, regular job. And because of this channel and because of meeting a lot of you, you know, I've felt like this has become more of a hobby and more of a, a way to connect and more of a community. And that fits in with our theme here, which is we are Venom. You know, we've done 800 episodes of the show. I never thought we would make it this far. I never thought I could commit to something this long. And it, it showed, you know, a lot in me, like taught me a lot about myself. And it also showed me that we are building something here. We are building a community of fans who just love talking about symbiotes, you know, and, uh, and that means a lot to me. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on this journey with me, like I said. And this episode is dedicated to all of us. Ever since we heard in Brazil Comic-Con when Tom Hardy first went out there, you know, way back when we started this channel and we heard the whole audience chanting, we are Venom. I knew that's our slogan. That's what's for this channel. That's how we're going to rally each other and motivate each other. And that's what this episode is. You know, it is a rallying of us because I reached out to all of you. I posted on here, on Instagram, you know, anywhere on my community tab, all that stuff. I said, hey, if you're a creative person and you want to add something to the legacy of Venom just for fun. You know, obviously most of us will probably never get a chance uh, to work for Marvel, which is sad because I got a lot of cool, talented people that watch my channel and I'm very lucky to have that. And so when I was going through these ideas, I was like, this is amazing. A lot of these ideas are so much fun. In fact, every single one of them has something I really love about it. So what we're going to dive into today, for those who are new to this channel, I want to involve, you know, the, the parasite. That's what I call the people who view this channel. Uh, that's kind of our, our term of endearment for each other. And, uh, and not one of us is above the other, even though I'm the host of this channel, we all have a voice here. And I wanted to showcase that on episode 800 to make this episode a little bit more special than other episodes we've done in the past. So this episode is from all of you and from me too, and my friend PJ and my friend After Hours Art, Adrian. Um, there's a lot of great talent on this episode. I'm gonna be showing off some artwork and then reading like ideas from people who watch this channel. Each of you created your own version of Venom in the multiverse. And that's what I said. I wanted to do something Venomverse related because I had heard a while ago that they were gonna do the end of the Venomverse or the death of the Venomverse. And we started this channel around the time the original Edge of Venomverse miniseries came out. So what better way to kind of bookend this show from six years ago till now than to do a show here like this episode where you get some of your ideas heard. And so a lot of you, like I said, sent in your ideas for Venom and we're going to read those out here. So we're going to enter the Venomverse, enter the multiverse here on this episode. It's going to be a long episode, but I'll try to edit it down the best I can. And we're going to talk about your ideas of what you would do with Venom if you were in charge of writing a short story in a Venomverse comic book. And then I'm going to share my idea at the end that features artwork from my friend Adrian, which is After Hours Art on Instagram. And I'll put a link to his stuff down below. And then also my friend PJ Katakutin, who I'll put a link to his Instagram down below. Please follow them and follow each other. And if you did contribute something this episode, you know, let it be known down in the comments, you know, let us know how you like the final edit of this. If you, you know, if we did you justice by reading your idea, all the feedback, let it be known down below. And then all of you follow each other, subscribe to each other. And if you make content, you know, let us know. This is a community episode. This one it's dedicated to all of us. So let's make it about us. So without further ado, let's dive in. Alex Wilson brings us to earth APB-42. One night while Bucky the Wonder Pup was walking around the lake by his childhood home, a shield jet crash landed in the shore. When Bucky investigated, he found Venom. They bonded instantly, overeating things and not caring about what they ate. Eventually, they met an even larger eater, a being known as Galactus. The three became the best of friends as they scoured the universe for unsuspecting worlds to devour. The Avengers fell, the X-Men fell, even Asgard was consumed. The Celestials tried to make new worlds fast enough, but they couldn't keep up. The Watchers lost track of all the worlds consumed. In the end, a battered Tony Stark and an unholy Stephen Strange made a pact with the three best friends the universe had ever seen. They would transport the trio to different universes to eat different multiversal threats. 
They consumed rogue zombie Eternals, an Ultron made from the metal of Mjolnir, and a Captain America that texted in movie theaters. Alex, thank you so much for your idea. I thought this one was so fun to do a symbiote dog flying through space on a silver surfer surfboard and eating planets with Galactus to the point where they ate everything. But luckily, when they get back to Earth, that's where a Tony Stark, an evil Tony Stark and Doctor Strange kind of come up with an idea to send them into the multiverse to eat worlds there to spare their planet. So pretty neat stuff. I like that. And, uh, and I, you know, I can't thank you enough for your idea. Alex is an amazing friend of mine, has been on this channel before. I've known him for years and years. He was even kind of a roommate of mine at one point uh, in LA, like, you know, crashing with me and stuff. Always been an awesome dude, a very talented person as well. And I'm glad he shared a story with us today. Gene Hoyle takes us to Earth NN-892011. Ben Grimm transported to Battle World with the other heroes of the Marvel Universe in a story called The Secret Wars is caught up in a never-ending fight between good and evil. Battle World has a unique effect on Ben. He begins to change back from his rocky form into his human identity. Hearing about a costume mending machine, Ben decides that he needs an outfit for his human form. It becomes clear that he can choose the look that the costume takes. As the black ooze from the costume machine that Ben found slithered over his body, it began to take shape based on things he saw in his mind. First up, aviator goggles over his face. Then a red mask, much like Warren Worthington's original angel costume from the X-Men, that went around his face exposing his cheeks, jaw, and his hair. A black bomber jacket covered his red shirt, and he wore black pants to match, along with a symbol with a four on it on his belt buckle. Combat boots and work gloves finish the ensemble. Ben immediately learned that the costume can make and hurl projectiles in various shapes and forms. As a fan of Captain America from the old days, he often forms a black triangular shield with a red four logo at its center. Sometimes Ben even wields a sword made out of the symbiote to go along with his shield. Towards the end of the Secret Wars, Ben has a startling dream. It's his costume. It has sensed his severe loneliness and lets him know that he never has to be alone again. The symbiote also shares all of its full capabilities and histories, downloading the images and memories directly into Ben's mind. After the war's end, fearing that he would once again become the thing on Earth, Ben decides to roam space as Grimm. His adventures are talked about in every way station across the galaxy. Together with the new symbiote, Grimm stopped a second Kree scroll war, he bested the champion of the universe in combat, and freed the symbiotes from Clintar and found them a new home. He occasionally even teamed up with his old family, the Fantastic Four, though he never again set foot on Earth. Hey, Gene, thanks so much for the story, man. I really did appreciate it. I know you're a big Ben Grimm fan. You're a big Fantastic Four fan like I am. And it was really cool to hear you tell a story set after the days of Secret Wars, because for those who don't know, after Secret Wars, the Fantastic Four came back to Earth, but not with Ben Grimm. Ben Grimm actually stayed behind on Battleworld for a while, and it kind of tore apart some of his relationships with the people he knew on Earth. And so when he came back, he had to rebuild stuff like with Alicia Masters and things like that. So the idea that Ben finds the costume machine before Peter and he's the one who gets imbued with the symbiote as he turns back into his human form, because that's what happened on Battleworld. The temptation was there for him to look more human or be human and not be a rock monster anymore. And I really like that you touched in on that because there is a miniseries or a one shot that's coming out called Dark Venom that stars Ben Grimm as, you know, Venom himself, but he's the thing and it takes place on Earth. So I like that yours didn't. I like that yours stayed on Battleworld, fit into the continuity of the actual Marvel Universe, and then you sent him off into space adventures and he kind of becomes, you know, a space, you know, Night Venom essentially with as, as Ben Grimm. So that was really cool and I really appreciate that and I hope everyone out there did as well. And let me know down in the comments what you think of Gene's story. The next story is from our friend Swordsman, and he brings us to Earth SM-901. And he puts in his that his alternate Venom idea is one based around more lore from the Spider-Man universe. But what if something just slightly different happened, which I love. That's the root of all what if stories is what if one little thing changed. And in this one, it was instead of Peter you know, exposing Eddie Brock in a way by taking down the Sin Eater, that what if he thought Eddie was actually telling the truth and he digs more into Eddie's, you know, discovery of who he's talking to, you know, his sources and everything like that. And they work together essentially to expose what's really going on. And you have the Sin Eater still taken down and you have the phony, I believe, still caught and everything. But then you also have the overreach committee fully exposed uh, by the Daily Beagle. So really cool idea. I love this one a lot because that means that Venom stays on as an antihero and early on mends the relationship with Spider-Man 
to the point where they don't completely hate each other. And I thought this was a cool approach that uh, that our friend Swordsman is, is doing here. And he goes on to say that you think things would start to get better for the wall crawler, but him and Venom still have to deal with the overreach committee and they allow Stuart Ward and Bob to be backed by the jury, which while the Fantastic Four, the suit, Spidey and Venom are able to defeat Bob once and for all, it still leads to a corruption in the Venom symbiote. The good news is that Anne Wang is still alive in this universe. So I love that Swordsman did that. That's fantastic. Because as he says, she didn't need to be refrigerated. So I like this a lot. Um, but in this timeline, it culminates in an alternate civil war where Venom joins the anti-reg side. His inclusion in Cap's team keeps the Punisher in line, leading to Frank staying in instead of being kicked out. And unlike in the main book where she is barely mentioned in Civil War Battle Report, Scream would be another full member of Cap's team. Venom and Spidey's new history would also lead into Venom joining Cap's debate with Peter on how the government can't be trusted and that Peter should instead join Cap, resulting in Spidey changing sides sooner, possibly changing the tide of the war in Cap's favor. Either way, this is a version of Venom who continued their character development without switching hosts. So I really, really love this. So he's basically, and I, I asked a few questions and he went back and said, yeah, this is a version where there, you know, there's still some turmoil and there's still some rocky openings with the characters of Venom and Spidey, but because Spidey decides, you know what, I'm going to lean into this and try to trust this guy a little bit more, they build a friendship a little bit sooner. Actually, they because they, they kind of just recently in comics built a friendship. And now in this one, they kind of start off a little rocky, but kind of work towards a, a friendship early on. By the time they get to Civil War, Eddie's even influential on Spider-Man joining the, you know, the registration or the anti-registration side with Captain America and keeping him over there instead of, you know, Spidey going to join Iron Man, which leads to some awful Spider-Man continuity afterwards with, uh, you know, people being shot that he loved and uh, deals with the devil being made. So I really like this one a lot, too, because I love that you mentioned Civil War, Matt Gargan thing didn't happen. Eddie and Peter's relationship wasn't so toxic that, you know, Eddie decides to, you know, sell off the costume and then try to, you know, self delete himself. I really like this. This is a, a much better, you know, for Eddie mentally timeline, I think, uh, where he's kind of, you know, accepted earlier on and given a chance earlier on and look how much of a difference that makes in his later years. And I think that's wonderful. And I think Swordsman, I think you absolutely crushed it on this one. I love this idea so much. So you guys out there who are listening, guys and gals, boils and ghouls, let me know down below. What do you think of Swordsman's idea? We have another fun one here from Nerd Girl Jean. This is on Earth NGJ-715. And I want to say here that I'm kind of filling in some gaps. Nerd Girl hasn't been feeling that well, and I still wanted to include her idea. And I tried to reach out to her at last minute to see if I can add something to this video. But unfortunately, I didn't get a response from her. So in the meantime, you know, Nerd Girl, I hope you're doing well out there. I hope uh, you're feeling well because I know you've been going through a lot of stuff with surgeries and other things going on. So please, I hope this finds you well. And I did my best uh, with the little bit of information you gave me to fill this out. So you guys buckle in for this. This is a sliver of a symbiote that gets left behind by a full Clintar symbiote. So I guess the symbiote ends up on Earth and then decides it wants to leave Earth, you know, kind of riot style from the first movie, I guess. And a sliver of it manages to stay behind. So it kind of gets stranded. It becomes a stray. And while it's slithering around looking for something, it finds a dog in an alley who is sick and possibly dying, who has a bad ear infection. And Nerd Girl did tell me that she was kind of a little bit basing this off of Ace, who has a bad ear infection, uh, you know, when he was rescued by us. And, uh, and so the symbiote slithers into the dog's ear, slowly bonds with it, uh, and then, you know, works its healing abilities to clear up the dog's ears. And the dog's name is Luna. So Luna and this symbiote become, you know, one, they have bonded now, and, uh, and they are now protectors of other animals on Earth, especially strays. So I put in here that the symbiote use its healing capabilities to heal Luna's ears as the two bond and become one together. Luna protects other strays as well as animals living in places where they are abused or neglected. Like Spawn, Luna hangs out in a particular alley, one where she was once abandoned. She doesn't know what happened to her human owners, and although she wants to use her powers and her new symbiote to find them, deep down Luna knows that they don't want her anymore. She's a stray, like the symbiote, and together they protect the animals of the world who need help. So I just wanted to share this little story. And like I said, I filled in a few blanks there. Hopefully, Nerd Girl, I did a little bit of justice to it. Um, and hopefully one day I can hear your full idea that you had because I'm an animal lover. Tom Hardy's an animal lover. A lot of us who watch the show are animal lovers. And to have this, you know, uh, two dog stories in one 
is so great. I love it. And, uh, and this one was really special because you try to include Ace and I appreciate that. But I also like the name Luna a lot. I think that's a cool name for a symbiote dog for sure. So let me know what you guys think down below of her story of Nerd Girl Story. I want to hear your thoughts in the comments. Next up, we have a great story here from our friend Lonely Symbiote, who did provide some artwork as well. So I'm going to show that off while I talk about this story, because this one is taking place on Earth 2300, and it is called Synergy, which I really like. Uh, the synopsis is the Sin Eater, a human that upon their ultimate demise, accepts a deal offered by a powerful spirit for a second chance at life. Investigative journalist Eddie Brock knows that every bargain has its price. But after he is murdered, he has no choice other than to accept the deal. Bonded to a peculiar creature of origin yet unknown to Eddie, he must learn to trust and work with his new partner to solve his own murder and protect his friends and family. Eddie is aided by his sister, Mary, and his former work colleague, Peter Parker, who himself is a supernatural entity known as Ananasi, a.k.a. the Were Spider. In this universe, Eddie can only become venom at night or in areas that sunlight cannot touch. The odd shadow creature, nicknamed V, as no one can pronounce the actual name of the creature, seems weakened by sunlight. Fire still harms it, but sound does not. Rather than web swing, Venom can enter one shadow and emerge from another to travel more quickly in addition to the usual wall crawling and parkour. The spider emblem is present on V due to it and Eddie's friendship with Peter and the other spiders as well. The name Venom was decided upon by Eddie, who vowed to do nothing short of be a deadly Venom to anyone who would harm him or the innocence of his city. Beyond super strength, speed, healing, and their monstrous appearance, Eddie and V communicate psychically. Eddie is stubborn, but very observant and intelligent. He cares deeply for others and carries a strong sense of justice, even if his moral compass isn't always in the right place. Over time, he will learn to see shades of gray that compromise the world of both the mundane and supernatural. V is a fairly playful creature that openly harbors a dark sense of humor, as well as a dreadful love of puns and quips. It shares an Eddie's sense of justice and desire to protect at any cost, drawn to his soul for that very reason. Eddie's sister Mary is an aspiring photographer. Her dream has been to work with her big brother on his investigations and provide the photographs for his big stories. Mary tries to act as Eddie and V's moral compass, pulling them back from becoming the very monsters that they fight. Being the younger sibling, it was complications from Mary's birth that would cause the death of their mother. Their father would grow cold and distant after his wife's death, leaving Eddie, only eight at the time, to step in and try his best to be there for his sister as they grew up. Creatures of the night that would do harm to others, beware, for Eddie and V are out there, ready to fight, ready to strike, ready to bite. Hey, Lonely, this was really awesome, and I love that you included Mary in this story. I'm such a fan of whatever happened to that character, and I hate that she was retconned out during Donnie Cates' run, even though she wasn't a huge part of Eddie's life before, but I thought there was a well there that you know other writers could go to and mine some stories out of. And uh, no one ever did because, you know, she was retconned and she's no longer part of the story. And that's a real bummer because, uh, you know, I, I always believe that when you write stories, you're not supposed to take away. You're not supposed to subtract. You're just supposed to add. And if there's something that doesn't work for your story, you just don't mention it and you move on. So I just always thought that was a weird decision to be, you know, that was made to retcon Mary. But I'm glad you brought her back in this. And I'm glad that her and Eddie had a close relationship and that they became friends. And on some earth out there, they are working side by side and protecting people. So that is very cool. So you guys let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below of Lonely Symbiote Story. Next up, we have two ideas from Twisty, but these are really concise ones because it's not really a story idea. It's more of like a character bio for two different characters. So we're going to go to Earth TO-SCAR.2, and we're going to meet Edward Brock, age 20, and Kenny Cassidy, age 19. So in this world, Edward is best friends with a guy named Benjamin who went to high school with them. Benjamin is the Spider-Man of this universe, but obviously Edward doesn't know that. Uh, so they're good friends, but he doesn't know that side of them. But then they go to college together and they become roommates and slowly their friendship starts to fall apart. Finances get in the way, girls, things like that, and they start to split apart as friends. And then it's at this point when Edward wants to move out, he wants to go back to his apartment, get his stuff, and he comes across the rejected symbiote from Benjamin that ends up in their dorm room and then it bonds to Edward and he becomes Venom. So that is kind of what's going on and his like a growing hatred for his friend. Now that he has a symbiote, he knows that Benjamin is Spider-Man and makes him hate him even more because he kept this from him all these years. And it, you know, it just furthers that uh, resentment towards each other that they have. So then that's what triggers and creates 
the venom of this universe. Uh, but there's also Kenny Cassidy, who is a 19 year old who was an ordinary farm boy who turned serial killer. Uh, he was strolling around in the big city when boom, Venom and Spider-Man were in a fight and Venom left a little of himself on a crate nearby. Being a curious little serial killer investigating the crate and soon bonded with the symbiote spawn and became carnage so that's pretty much what it is like carnage is you know grew up uh kenny cassidy grew up on a, a farm and then slowly grew into serial killer tendencies did uh, probably a lot of damage in a small town where he's from and then decided to come to the big city to you know be, see if he could become an even bigger more well-known serial killer or find more victims i guess and then when he's here the first night off the bus you know which we've seen in venom comics before he looks up and he sees this big battle going on and then boom, a, a sliver of the symbiote rains down on him uh, or nearby him, and he goes and bonds with it. So there you go. That is Twisty's idea. I thought it was really cool, real short and sweet, but I like that and very clear cut. And so let me know what you think of Twisty's idea down in the comments below because I loved it. It was awesome. Next up, VCXZ is taking us to Earth TC-1997. And this is where investigative journalist Eddie Brock gained fame when he put a stop to the Sin Eater murders, but bit off more than he could chew when he decided to take on the notorious Fortunato crime family. I love that they're tying these two in together. That's amazing. An attempt on Eddie's life by the Fortunato enforcer Dark Angel left Eddie's body covered in severe burns that would surely take his life. That's when he was approached by Dr. Kurt Connors, who saved Eddie's life by splicing his DNA with a snake's. As Eddie shed his damaged skin, he realized he gained increased strength enhanced senses, and the ability to project paralyzing energy likened to a snake's venom. Armed with these powers, including his signature Venom Fang attack, I love that you put that in there, that's so great, Eddie fights crime in the streets as well as in the papers as the one and only Venom. This concept is heavily influenced by Tangent Comics, a DC Comics imprint from 1997. The premise of Tangent is to reinterpret characters and concepts by taking a name and going in a different direction with them, which, yes, they did. And I, th I thought Tangent was a lot of fun, for sure. Uh, this version of Venom interprets the name literally as well as being a spin on the Spider-Man origin story of someone who gains powers from an animal. This also keeps Venom as a street-level hero, which I think is something that's been lacking over the last few years. I thought it would be interesting to reference the second Venom, Angela Fortunato, who in this version successfully bonded with the symbiote and became Dark Angel. And something I only realized later is that the pitch is a heroic serpent against an evil angel. This is the inverse of how these types of characters are normally portrayed in Christian mythology, which would make for an interesting connection to Eddie's Catholic faith. I love this so much. This is so, so cool. I love that you tied into Catholicism a little bit and have this imagery of a snake man versus an angel man. Um, but the roles are reversed where the snake is the good guy and the angels kind of the bad guy. You know, this is really cool. And then the, the fact that you put in the Fortunato family and tied all that in together is so cool. So Eddie in this world was successful in, you know, taking down the Sin Eater and exposing him and getting him captured instead of Spider-Man. And he kind of becomes a hero in a way. And then he gets put into this situation where Dr. Kirk Connors, and I love that you use Dr. Kirk Connors because, you know, him splicing, you know, lizard DNA with himself, doing snake uh, DNA to heal Eddie for, you know, various reasons, comic book reasons, I think is fantastic. So this is cool. What a neat idea. I'm so glad I could share it here with you all. So thank you, VCX, for sending it in. And you all let us know what you think of VCX idea down in the comments below. Now we have Andrew Singleton taking us to Earth GV-1989, which is kind of a Giver universe, which I love. I'll have some images go up there if you've never seen Giver. Um, really cool character. Came out in like 1989, I think was the movie, and then 1984 was the comic book or somewhere around there. And uh, and Giver is someone who bonds with a symbiote suit, essentially. Almost like Blue, more like Blue Beetle kind of, but a little bit of Venom too, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, it is extraterrestrial, but so is the Blue Beetle thing. And there's communication between the two, kind of like Blue Beetle, but it's still like Giver is, is really neat. He's kind of like this, you know, space ninja thing. And it's a, it's a really cool idea. David Hayter, who played him in the movie, is also the voice of Solid Snake in the Solid Snake video games, most of them anyway. Diving in, Andrew introduces us to Kronos, which is a major corporation that owns the Life Foundation. And the Life Foundation, they're dealing with experiments, alien technology, things like that, going all the way back to the dawn of humanity and trying to find connections between humans and aliens. So pretty neat stuff, kind of like the movies a little bit. And, and that's what you'll see here. Andrew has a lot of movie influence in this, which is really cool. I like this a lot because where Eddie fits in is that he's a globe reporter 
from San Francisco, just like in the movies. And he's made a name for himself by shining a spotlight on corporations like this and all their shady business dealings and, and, you know, experimentations and things like that. So, uh, so Eddie is out there doing his thing and his investigation leads him to a facility where there are people in tanks, but not just people, but also things known as others. Eddie Brock actually gets caught here in this world and he is experimented on and used as one of the lab subjects for the Life Foundation with the bonding process. And he becomes Venom. And that's when he breaks free, gets out, stops them there, I guess, and then goes out and then starts protecting people in San Francisco, becoming a hero. And starting with people that live underground, people that were failed experiments from the Life Foundation that kind of got dumped. Some who died and their bodies washed down through the sewers and others who somehow managed to live and scrape by and are living down there as well. So Eddie's kind of becoming a protector of them uh, with his new uh, you know, powers or his other that's bonded to him now. He does have similar powers, but this time the whispers in his head are not actually the symbiotes, but they're Eddie's own voice, his own whispers into his head. So there's some differences there. There's a lot more psychologically going on in this one that I noticed that Andrew's adding in. And uh, and it shows that, you know, Eddie is a decent guy overall, but he comes with a lot of baggage in this world, uh, more so than typical. And uh, and I find that interesting. I definitely like that little touch there. Uh, but then, like I said, there's some of the Giver elements too. So that's where, you know, you have this voice just perpetually talking to you but it's not like a creepy monster voice. It's not like a robotic synthetic voice. It's Eddie's voice just constantly echoing through his mind and talking to him and trying to steer him right or wrong in, a, in many ways. And I thought that was a really neat touch for sure. So even though Eddie's a focus in this story, there is like a co-star in a woman named Shay Barker and she is looking for her missing father. And her story kind of leads her into a path that crosses over with Eddie and you know Venom and everything. Andrew added here, he always liked the Mole City from the initial Lethal Protector run, so he wanted to put something like that in there and deal with the you know underground societies and things like that. Um, so I love that. And then he also wanted to you know, add other things in here like Jurassic Park and stuff. So the Life Foundation is creating a bunch of different monsters and there's a lot of neat stuff that they're working on that I guess at some point get released down into this underground city where Eddie now has to step up and protect and also while helping Shay find her father and, and what might have, you know, where what his story might be, whether he got turned into an experiment also, or if he's down here half dead in, in the city somewhere, that's the story that they're trying to, you know, flesh out here. So yeah, great job, Andrew. This is really cool. I like that there's some mystery to it, that there's some, you know, body horror stuff to it as well. And that, you know, Venom and everything is a little bit different than, you know, what we normally see Eddie as and stuff. He's kind of Giver-esque which I like. I think that's cool because uh, it makes him seem more of a product of like human experimentation, even though he's still made up of an alien symbiote that the Life Foundation and Kronos got their hands on. So really, really cool. I thought this idea was another really awesome one. So thank you, Andrew, for submitting it and sharing it with all of us. And I want to hear your thoughts. What do you guys think of Andrew's idea down below in the comments? And last but not least, we are going to my earth that I created with PJ Katakuten and my friend Adrian, aka After Hours Art. This is Earth SPA-511. And on this Earth, you know, we're going to get to who actually Venom is towards the end because most of my idea, I want to be a setup. You know, this is like a issue zero, as it were, to the real story because the real story is going to star Hobie Brown because on this Earth, Hobie Brown is the first human host of the Venom symbiote uh, or one of them, as we're going to find out. So really, really neat. I wanted to take the idea of we are Venom to another level but I also wanted to see what the world would be like if Nick Fury really was prepared for everything. So in this world, because, you know, Nick is typically prepared for everything in the main Marvel universe, he's experienced a lot of failures in that regard where he didn't see things like Galactus coming or Thanos, you know, or the infinity stones. How could he know that stuff? He's just a man. He's got, he's limited to what his knowledge is here on earth. And so in this reality, that Nick Fury, he's kind of similar you know, after Vietnam he experiences the symbiotes for the first time along with Rex Strickland. So we kind of tie in a little bit of that from the Donnie Cates run into this, where from there, Nick is like, okay, we are not alone in the universe. We have to be ready for threats. We don't know where these things came from. So let's start planning for this. He almost takes a Tony Stark approach from the movies where Tony wanted to put a suit of armor on every street corner and kind of uh, rob people of free will in order to save them, right? And that's kind of what Nick Fury does in this universe. Um, he actually calculates and predicts everything that they possibly could encounter and starts building a machine that he calls Sentinel. 
and he is developing it with other scientists and some of the brightest you know minds on the planet some of them who aren't even getting powers on this world you know so i think that was my most fun i had was finding who would be on the this team here which nick fury calls the intelligentsia uh, which is from marvel comics it's normally a bad guy team so these scientists are bolivar trask arnim zola reed richards sue storm howard stark monica rapacini and Moira McTaggart. And uh, Moira is a mutant, obviously, in this one. Uh, but And Monica has her, like, you know, slight abilities. But most of the others don't. Reed Richards and Sue Storm never went into space. So they're just brilliant scientists in this one, which is already awesome enough. <laughs> and then you have Bolivar Trask and everyone. And together, they all created Sentinel. They all contributed something to this amazing artificial intelligence that's kind of like a life model decor I started out as one and then kind of evolved into a sentinel and then kind of evolved into a bastion slash ultron and now it can go from the deepest levels of the ocean to the farthest reaches of space scanning stuff it's almost like a watcher it's not meant to get involved unless it absolutely has to it's made for some of the toughest material on earth like vibranium obviously and adamantium so this thing is a one-stop killing machine if it needs to be. Um, I kind of wanted to make something like Gort from The Day the Earth Stood Still, which is my favorite movie. So that's kind of what Sentinel is in this universe. But Fury also has a field team because they've dealt with symbiotes before. All those symbiotes in Vietnam were all eradicated. So, symb you know, he's still, Nick Fury is like thinking about what could come next. And because of that, he has Sentinel out there scanning for stuff and he's able to detect every threat. So Galactus never really shows up to Earth to try to eat it because it stopped before it even gets to Earth. And Thanos never ever gets his hands on the Infinity Stones because one by one, the stones are destroyed by you know Sentinel and, and Fury's you know, team and stuff. And his team does involve super enhanced people. You have Richard and Mary Parker. You have Dum Dum Dugan, Phil Coulson, Maria Hill, Sharon Carter, GW Bridge, Rex Strickland, and Bucky Barnes. All of them are enhanced individuals, much like Winter Soldier type people, um, but they're not like as brainwashed. Um, they have a little bit more free will, or at least they think they do, because this Nick Fury, like I said, is willing to go to any level to protect things. So he's protected against Galactus, Thanos, other big threats, Krees, Scrolls, a lot of them before they even reach Earth's atmosphere. That's how prepared this Nick Fury is. Um, so what happens when someone is that prepared? What happens when they are that ready for everything? Well, the Beyonder shows up and it's like, all right, I'm going to do the secret wars and I'm going to pluck random good guys and bad guys and bring them up here and have them battle each other to decipher what's better, good or evil, you know, or whatever his plan was in secret wars. And, uh, you know, cause it was very out there and, you know, very super villainy and, uh, and over the top. But Fury kind of already planned for something, a possibility that this could happen because he's got this Sentinel, this AI, who is constantly coming up with different scenarios that villains could use to wipe out humanity and attacks they could do. And, and there was a, you know, kind of a, a simulation run where what if people were just randomly picked? So Nick Fury found a way to target certain people and send only enhanced people up there that would all work together. So Beyonder thinks he's getting good and bad people, but it turns out it was just all these people that Fury was mind controlling to do good and do bad so that they would be picked and sent up to the Beyonders, uh, you know, battle world. And then they all team up and kill the Beyonder up there and stop that threat as well. So this Fury is on top of everything along with the help of his scientists and his Sentinel and everything. So it's a group effort for sure, but Fury is the one kind of manipulating certain things happening. And, and people like Reed and Sue are starting to be like, okay, are we really doing good things? Like what's really happening here? Even Arnim Zola is getting scared by some of the levels that they're going to, to protect humanity. And, and that's where things, you know, kind of fall down into the street level, because after you take out all the big threats, after you take out the Galactuses and the Thanoses and the Krees and the Scrolls and the Beyonders and the Celestials. And once you take all that down and silver surfers and everything, what do you got left? You got this planet that nobody wants to come pick on anymore. And so what does someone like Fury, this version of Nick Fury, do with his idle hands and his equipment and his team and his robot? Uh, what does he do? So he decides, you know, when he comes across on Battleworld, one of the team members, Bucky Barnes, brings back a symbiote that he found in a costume machine. And that's when, you know, Fury is looking at this going, OK, this is the next step. And he begins to experiment. And this time he's cutting out. Reed Richards, Sue Storm, some of the other, you know, scientists who aren't liking what he's doing. He's getting new scientists like Hank McCoy and Nathaniel Essex, who is Mr. Sinister, and he's getting them to work for him because his methods are getting more and more extreme. 
to protect humanity and mutants and anyone who's living on earth. That's basically his goal. And so they create these sleeper cells. They take this one venom symbiote that they found and they chop it up into 111 pieces and they inject them into a bunch of soldiers during the Iraq war, hoping it'll enhance them in new ways along with a chip that, you know, Fury can control them with because he saw these things in action in Vietnam and he's like, well, this will be the next threat. So if we have one, we can build a small army to be ready for when something like Null shows up. And so that's what he's ultimately preparing for is some kind of big invasion from symbiotes because that's the one thing they haven't encountered yet on this earth is a full on invasion from symbiotes. So Nick Fury has his army of, you know, sleeper cells, sleeper venoms out there. And uh, they're all called sleeper agents. And that's because the name sleeper, which I love from the, the most recent symbiote edition that was added in the comic books. And in this one, you have all these sleeper agents and one of them is Hobie Brown. And one day he's on the bus, he's going to work and he witnesses a, a guy who is really doing awful things on a bus, terrorizing people, grabbing a woman inappropriately and, and crossing a line and everyone just kind of standing by. And this was kind of inspired by a story that I had heard about and kind of looked into a little bit, but I don't know the full story where a woman was assaulted in front of a bunch of people on a subway train and no one did anything. And it made me sick to my stomach. And I think it would make Nick Fury of this world sick to his stomach uh, when I was starting to piece together some of these ideas. And so Nick Fury sees this going on through Hobie's eyes because Hobie and everyone who has one of these symbiote slivers in them who were all soldiers and have now been discharged and are living normal lives. I have Hobie still being a window washer because that's what he was in the comics before he became the Prowler. And so he's a discharged soldier He's, you know, now a window washer and he's just waiting to be activated for whenever symbiotes attack. But then Fury is like, I don't think they're ever coming. We've waited years and years and all these soldiers are discharged. They're, you know, back to normal lives. So I need to keep them limber and I need to keep, keep them ready in case the symbiotes do show up to attack. So whenever I see a petty crime going on, a street crime or something like this where a woman's being assaulted, Nick Fury's like, Hobie Brown activated. And Hobie Brown gets activated and he turns into the costume. And our version of the costume, I'll have the image up there. You'll see that there's no eyes on it. I figured in this world, it never bonded to a Spider-Man. So it never copied his eye design. Uh, so it just has a circle on the face, you know. Uh, but that circle is so Hobie can see. It is not actually a, a set of eyes from the symbiote. It is just a, a layer of saliva. You can see almost right through it. Um, it's like this like spit bubble almost, like a really thick one. And so you can see that there's a human under there. But as Hobie gets more enraged, he takes down this one guy. And then as the threats, the street level threats get a little bit higher because, you know, maybe he's fighting a regular guy in this instance and he's protecting this woman. But then the next instance, he might run across someone like Big Wheel or Armadillo, someone with a little bit of powers. And then he has another phase where he mutates more and the hole gets wider and you start seeing teeth grow around the hole and you realize the hole is actually the mouth and it's just sitting there wide open. So, you know, the host inside can see and then you'll see spikes and other things and claws grow longer in the second form. And there will be a third form. I don't have a photo of it yet because, you know, obviously hiring an artist and stuff takes time and takes money and I, I'm unable to complete the third drawing, but I will share it with you one day on the community tab when it is done. Uh, but the third idea will basically be full on like the blob movie poster, which was one of my big inspirations for this, along with Resident Evil 2's G Monster, where the third phase of Venom actually has the, you know, the human pushing up with all the saliva stretching and they're screaming they have a screaming in pain face Hobie has and you have all the teeth around them and you have the big claw arms and he kind of looks like a G virus monster uh, from Resident Evil 2 and uh, with a human just sitting in the middle, which is kind of like Resident Evil 4 ish a little bit as well. So I just thought that was cool and, and body horror ish and, and makes it scarier because then if you see something that's a human inside trapped screaming for help, essentially, um, because that's what's happening, uh, you know, the the pain it's causing Hobie when it gets to that third phase is causing so much pain that he's literally sc stuck in a perpetual screaming and pain motion, but his brain shuts down and the creature takes over. And because now there's just a little bit of sliver was injected in his bloodstream. You got to imagine that all of these characters, all these 111 symbiote infected people are essentially like carnage. They're bonded on a cellular level just ready to rip and tear through things because it's painful. It's painful to have this little sliver manifest itself and grow inside you and try to deliver the attributes that it does, but using your blood and, you know, and everything inside of you to make up the extra mass that it needs. So this symbiote works 
a little bit more like carnage where the host becomes a little liquidy inside. Um, but that's why the saliva is there. That's why, you know, it's trying to protect the human from transforming too much uh, because going back into phase one from phase three can be really tricky for this creature. So yeah, this is a very different Venom. And like I said, this is a very different Nick Fury. And this is a world where these sleeper agents are all over the place. And that's where the book or the issue zero ends where you, you see Hobie stop that crime. And then you see him later, you know, or another one, another symbiote take down the armadillo or, you know, big wheel or something in another phase. And you see all three phases of these suits. And then you pull back and you see Fury looking at all these monitors that have all of the hundred plus people that have been affected all doing, you know, stopping crimes and stuff. And, uh, and they're saying, you know, we are Venom collectively because it's all one symbiote split up. So when we say we are Venom, there's actually an army of them. It's like, we are Legion. And uh, so that's what I really want to do. And that's kind of has a little, a bit of a, you know, a religious undertone with the, we are Legion thing. I kind of wanted that in there as a part of this, because that's kind of fitting in the theme of Venom typically. So yeah, you have your everyman, you know, Hobie Brown, kind of like how Eddie Brock was just like an everyman who ended up in this situation. You have your person with the broken compass, which is Nick Fury. He definitely has a broken moral compass in this universe, but he has the ability to shine a lot of that brokenness because he's doing all these things that are protecting the world, but are coming at greater and greater costs to the point where he's literally stripping people of their humanity all to be ready for you know, future threats that are coming in. So yeah, there's a lot going on here. And then you also have the symbiote, you know, being body horror-ish and having, you know, those elements in here. So it's kind of a perfect blend of a lot of things I love. Day the Earth Stood Still, Resident Evil, you know, the Marvel Universe in general, and kind of all splashed together. So I want to thank my friend Adrian, who drew the image of Hobie Brown with me. Uh, he let me do the pencils and then he did the inks and colors over it. And I think it came out amazing. I love this version of Hobie. Like I said, he's just an everyman. He's a regular guy former soldier, now window cleaner, trying to do his best, trying to get through life, taking public transportation, trying to, you know, get by living check to check, you know, not getting a lot of help from the VA sometimes going through those struggles. And then this all comes along where he finds out that he's actually a secret sleeper agent and he's the first one to snap free of it. And that's where issue zero ends. And Nick Fury looks at the camera and is like, Oh crap. <laughs> so if, uh, if one can break free, can the rest break free? And what will that mean for Nick Fury's plans? That's the setup for the book. And that's what my idea is for Venom. All right. That's it. This was a long episode. I'm going to try to edit down the best I can and get it to you guys very, very soon. So thank you so much for watching. If you have an idea for Venom and you weren't in this episode, I want to hear it in the comments below. We can keep talking down there. And if you have a favorite or just want to comment on everyone's version of Venom, leave comments, just flood us with comments down below. I want to hear it. I want to hear everyone's feedback. I think this is so awesome. I got a chance to do something like this and shine a light on all of us because we are all Venom. And it was so cool to do this for the last six years but we're not done yet. We still got more. We got a third movie coming up. We got a lot of comics we got to talk about. So we're going to get into it very, very soon. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.